uh, I think uh, uh, Ken Sanders bookstore might have one or two. What do you think? Yeah. I'm just wondering if it's doing something now. It seems to be doing something. I don't know why it's not playing. Is it in there right now? I think so, yeah. I'm also not very good with Max. Why don't you get rid of this and just play that? Maybe maybe it's getting confused. Yeah, just Let's see. Where is it? If anyone knows more about Max than I do, it's not I in don't there now. Much about Max. Is the um, well, I want you to know that this is disastrous. Um, um, and the only way I can account for this is that, you know, certain planetary political vermin <laughs> have taken hold. I cannot account for this. Um, is there a disc in here right now? Is this it? Caldero in the world? No. No? No, is there a disc in there right now? I think so. Why don't you reject it? That's not it? And no, it should be here under, without any names. So it's not in the world? I've played this many times in many places. Well, why don't we keep working? Why don't we have the other speakers first and we keep working on it? Yes, what a brilliant idea. Maybe we can solve it and then you come back. And Thank you. And we have a grand finale. Because I... I, I I really ran out of stories that I would rather tell. Okay. And now I, I, I don't want to move into my joke uh, mode. So why don't the next speaker please... Uh, and we'll just try to solve this problem, okay? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully I won't have the same issues because I also need audio. Thank you. I hope I don't have the same problem. Oh, yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. As long as the audio works, we'll be okay. I'm going to test it real quick. There is no audio. No audio? There is no audio. Okay, well then we need a librarian up here, a good technician. Unfortunately, my presentation won't work either without audio. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we reverse the order. But that's a different problem. Your file's coming up, and it's not just no audio? Yeah, there's no audio present. I'm going to bounce through this. It's up all the way. Well, you can just change the settings to it going through the... Let's try it out and see. I think that's a completely different problem. That can probably be... Now I'll play through this. If we've got an aux cord, we can do that. No, we don't. What are the discs? Can you play through? Let's see. Just the straight up HDMI. Can we get some a technician up here?
There we go. Yay. Yay. Okay. All right. All right. All right. I guess I will proceed now that I have solved at least my issues here. Um, all right. Uh, so the piece that I'm going to present to you is called Arsenic Requiem. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction of it. And I'm, I, I've got some quotes that I want to uh, preface it by. I've kind of structured it. Imagine like a Big Mac where we have the weird third bun in the middle. We have one, two, three. I've got quotes that kind of form those, uh, shall we say, buns around <laughs> the, the uh, meat of what I want to talk about. Um, so I am uh, primarily a composer. I'm musically trained. My degrees are in music. Um, but before that happened, when I was deciding what I wanted to go into, it was always between uh, something nature-oriented, particularly like geology and music, and somehow music won out. So if there had been this environmental humanities degree available when I was going through college, I probably would have done it. Um, but as a composer, I get to combine these two things, my love of and knowledge of music, and my love for nature and the natural environment around us, and put it together in, in very interesting ways. Um, so the quote that I want to start out with that is going to preface Arsenic Requiem is uh, from someone who is as great a writer as they are and a conservationist and scientist, that's Aldo Leopold, uh, from his book, uh, A Sand County Almanac, one of my favorite books. He says, we abuse land and, I would say, by extension, water, because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. Um, so Arsenic Requiem is about the current situation of the Great Salt Lake. And I want you to think of it more as a story told through sound than as a musical composition. While there are a lot of musical elements in it, uh, it's, it's more of a story. And everything in it is highly symbolic. Um, so it, it, it warrants some explanation beforehand. So what you're going to start hearing is you'll hear uh, the wind blowing, You'll hear birds singing, um, and you'll hear a string orchestra in, in the background. And what the string or orchestra represents is the beautiful interconnections of life, the web of life that we've heard so much about today, intact. It's, it's consonant, it's beautiful, it's pleasing, um, and everything seems all right. Uh, I find that there's a lot of parallels between the way that music is structured uh, and the way that nature is structured. The counterpoint, the balance, the things that make up music uh, are almost analogous to what goes on in nature. And so we hear this beautiful balance in, in the music. And as time goes on, and I have it... Uh, structured so that if we were facing the north, um, you would hear coming in from the east disruptions. You would hear uh, wagons coming in, uh, industrialized society coming in. And as, and as more and more things are built, as industry and technology progresses, there starts to be connections in that string orchestra disrupted. There starts to be dissonance introduced certain instruments start to sound out of whack. They, con they con um, contradict what's going on in the rest of the, the instruments, and it becomes more and more. Uh, as technology progresses, you'll hear the railroad, the transcontinental railroad being built. Uh, and at, at that point, you'll also hear uh, Morse code. And what that Morse code is saying is... Uh, it says, the last rail is laid, the last spike is driven, the Pacific Railroad is completed, which is the actual message that was transmitted via, via telegraph in 1869. Um, that Morse code will soon change as we hear more trains, more industry, more technology, um, radio waves, television, mass media, transportation. That Morse code will change into industry which is both a reflection of what's going on in the sound, but it also happens to be the Utah State motto, uh, for those of you who didn't know. Um, so, but industry becomes louder and louder and louder. And as it becomes louder, the string orchestra is thrown into absolute chaos, into di to distress. The web of life is, is disassembled, shredded, taken apart. 
uh, until it's almost unrecognizable. And at the point where the Morse code industry becomes loudest, um, I put in a quote from a, a 17th century Baroque opera um, titled Dido and Aeneas. There's a famous lament in there. Uh, and, and the quote from that part, it's as if I, w I was studying this piece to teach in other classes and I was also thinking about the lake and all of this stuff, but there's a part in it where it says, death is now a welcome guest. And I imagined the lake perhaps saying that. Uh, and so we hear that quote, the sounds of industry and transportation. A lot of these sounds are sounds that I recorded actually. In fact, uh, I recorded I-15 from that bridge right there. Uh, and I recorded a whole bunch of freight trains and front runner from the train station just across the freeway over there. Uh, those uh, continue to grow louder and louder. Eventually we hear another quote from that same opera, that same lament, where it says, remember me, but ah, forget my fate. Uh, and the string orchestra, or, or the, that music fades out. You do hear the string orchestra come back, but it's almost unrecognizable. The web of life has been completely disrupted uh, to the point where it's, it's almost screaming in agony. Uh, the final pitches of that orchestra, although you can't really hear them as such, are the pitches D, E, A, and D, uh, spelling dead. <laughs> so I know it's, it's, rather, it's rather dark and bleak, but um, it's, it's uh, my imagination of, of you know, what, how, how the lake must feel being starved of, of its uh, source of life and as a result us starving ourselves in that way. Um, finally at the end the, the piece closes kind of in the same way that it began. Um, this gives it a sense of, of musical unity but also um, it closes with the wind blowing. Uh, this time though the wind is full of toxic arsenic uh, being blown off of the lake bed. And instead of birds, we hear crickets. Now, the reason I put the crickets there uh, is because that's often the, uh, the political and public uh, reaction to some of these issues uh, that crop up about the environment that has, it, it, that's just unfortunately been the case. Uh, and it dies away to the sounds of trains and industry in the, in the distance, and that's, that's the end of the piece. So uh, the next quote that I want to do before I actually play the piece is another one uh, by uh, Aldo Leopold. He says, we face the question whether a still higher standard of living is worth its cost in things natural, wild, and free. And so I will play this, uh, and as soon as it's finished, I'll, I'll give my last quote here. So this is Arsenic Requiem. <clears throat>
Thank you. 
so this was kind of my uh, musical idea on, on that first Leopold quote, how we've treated the lake more as a commodity than as part of our community um, to be treated with love and respect. Um, the, the last quote that I want to leave uh, before I finish up, um, I, I thought a lot about and uh, the, the speech that was given by Terry earlier was, was very uh, important to me about the, the spiritual aspect of the lake um, and how it can also be a place for, for healing and for discovery uh, and, and a place of, of, of wonder. And this is a quote that's actually very, very important to me. Um, this is uh, from a speech uh, given by Gordon B. Hinckley at the uh, 1996 centennial celebration of the state of Utah. He said, we must safeguard these magnificent natural wonders so that future generations may also draw strength and inspiration, and I would say life, uh, from the handiwork of the master creator. Um, and so uh, that's all I have. Thank you. I'm still connected. Still, still. I want to open them, and it's not this one. No. Any luck? No, it's it, keep, it keeps saying that oh. these are blank. Oh. I wouldn't, I wouldn't them wrong or something. All right. Get some yeah, get some money. It, it says the, the CDs are blank. Oh, they can't all be blank, can they? No, this is not blank. And this is, I mean, this is your CD number. It could be that, unless they have another thing I can play it there. Hmm, so do it earlier. Is he playing a secret too? No, he's, he had an electron, he had an electron. He just takes it. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it worked earlier yeah. after just a few seconds, yeah. but I'll just wait. Mm -hmm. I know, we'll see. It shouldn't take that long, right? It did. It worked earlier, like after maybe like five seconds. I mean, couldn't be detached here, right? Yeah. Well, it worked earlier, but I guess technology is officially on strike now across the board. I think it's because I bragged earlier that I didn't need sound. And now it's like, well, you need visuals, and so we're not going to take that from you as well. Um, I mean, maybe it'll come on. It, I mean, I tried it earlier specifically to avoid this, and it took like five seconds, and then it was there. I don't know what happened since. I, I really think it's the wrath of the technology gods because I... I said it would work. If... Exactly. Uh, let me try. I mean, yeah. It, it... I have one on my hard disk. Oh, there you go. See? That was the question of. Then you can maybe. Uh... Yeah, I don't know. It worked earlier, but. The only thing we could try if your computer works, I do have it on a flash drive, if you don't mind. Yeah. All right, sorry, give me one more second. If this doesn't work, I'm just going to talk. Um, at least we're all still alive, so I think that's good. No biological failure so far, just technological, so fingers crossed. Um, let me see. Since earlier, I mean, it worked fine earlier. Is that? 
part that's hanging off supposed to be plugged in somewhere? No, I think that's just if you have an apple. Yeah, I mean, this is exactly what I tried earlier, and then it worked, but yeah. I don't know. Maybe the USB C would actually work. Yeah, let's try that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good thing you reminded me. I have them on my hard disk as well. I think we solved this problem, so. Yeah. All right. I mean, yeah. I guess it doesn't work. We started. No. Yeah. Did it do something? Okay. It means that it's doing something. It's alive. Okay. Nobody move. Nobody breathe. We just hold our breath for 20 minutes. Um, all right. Okay. Excellent. Everything is working. We have the sound working here. We have the. The PowerPoint's working here. All right, let me jump right to it because technology already took enough of our time. Um, okay, so first of all, uh, it's kind of very daunting to talk about art in a room full of artists and art theorists because I'm just a mere philosopher. We do something much more bloodless and just kind of conceptualize things in the world but don't actually interact with the world. Um, so. I think when yeah, when Scott graciously asked me, you know, do you want to talk? I was like, okay, I can do that. And you even offered. He said you don't have to mention art, but I was like, no, I think that would be wrong. So I, I'm basically, I think tr I thought for myself through through this uh, through the question, right? What what actually? How can we think about the role of art, right, in actually helping us with all these environmental problems that we have right now? So I think my hope is that somehow I'm going to kind of choose a very high level of abstraction, but that all the art right, we've already heard and we will hear and the art we see around us, that that will maybe fill in some of the gaps. Um, and I do have some poetry, I think, that I want to uh, look at, but I think maybe for time reasons, right, I'll just maybe look at one or two uh, and leave it at that. Um, let me actually start just with this quote. I think I, I couldn't actually trace it to a specific source. I first heard it in the movie The Butler, um, and in that movie it had like racial connotations. Um, but um, I think this kind of encapsulates what I want to get at in this talk, because in a nutshell, I think what I want to talk about um, is the way in which we're kind of crowding out non-humans from our worlds. And I don't just mean this in a kind of material way, in the sense that we literally, um, you know, like causing species extinction or like putting, like, you know, concrete everywhere. Um, but I also mean that in the way we think about the world, non-humans become um, more and more... Uh, neglected, right? And I think that art can actually help us push back against that and it can maybe draw non-humans back in. And so I think you can read this quote in actually two ways. You can either see it from the perspective of non-humans, right? Animals, plants, fungi, um, bacteria complaining um, and saying, well, it's actually now a human world and we just live in it, right? We have to adapt, right? Like we have to just kind of make do um, with the noise and the light, light pollution, etc. You can also reverse it and can imagine that it's actually an insight that we as humans might have that despite everything, right, if we think about evolutionary history, if we think about the fact that we all need to drink and breathe and that we need sun um, and soil to actually eat, that it's still actually the world of non-humans, right? And I think in our keynote earlier, um, I think we heard that the earth in the end will be fine, right? So I think that's another way to think about the quote. Um, so here's right, the basic idea, as I said, right? I think that art maybe um, can help us make space uh, for, uh, for non-humans in our experience of the world. Um, and let me, like, may, may, let me maybe pick two poems that I want to read. Um, so I think, again, for reasons of time, I'm not going to comment on these poems too much. Um, I want to read uh, this one poem by the uh, Polish poet uh, Wisława Cimborska, seen from above. And then maybe later I'll read one short poem uh, by Joy Harjo, uh, the um, poet laureate uh, with uh, Muskogee Creek. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to start with this because I think it, it does a really good job of what I'm trying to say art can do, that it actually really focuses our attention on things we usually just, you know, like don't even see, right, because of the way we think about the world. Um, so I'm just going to read this. It's uh, uh, three, three slides, and it's about a dead beetle. Uh, a dead beetle lies on the path uh, through the field, three pairs of legs folded neatly on its belly. Instead of death's confusion, tidiness, and order, the horror of this sight is moderate. Its scope is strictly local, from the wheatgrass to the mint. The grief is quarantined. 
the sky is blue. To preserve our peace of mind, animals die more shallowly. They aren't deceased, they're dead. They leave behind, we'd like to think, less feeling and less world. Departing, we suppose, from a stage less tragic. Their meek souls never haunt us in the dark. They know their place. They show respect. And so the dead beetle on the path lies unmourned and shining in the sun. One glance at it will do for meditation. Clearly nothing much has happened to it. Important matters are reserved for us, for our life and our death, a death that always claims the right of way. And so just very briefly, right, there are a lot of ways to read this poem, but I think one thing that Jamborska does here is in the last line especially, right, that in the end we don't escape death either. I think the first part of the poem is kind of like how we like to think about ourselves, right, as kind of being apart from the world. But I think in the end she kind of pulls the non-human and the human world um, back together. Um, so let me maybe kind of just... Um, go like like outline the steps here right so i want to talk a little bit about what i mean by the human world right also known as the anthropocene i want to say give you a few examples of what i mean by the fact that we actually kind of have erased monuments from our world not just materially but even in the way we actually experience the world um, and then again right return to to art um, so very briefly what's the anthropocene I don't know how many people have heard of the Anthropocene. It comes from the Greek word anthropos, right, like human or man, and, you know, seen as in Holocene, right, like kind of epoch. Um, and so the Anthropocene is a somewhat contested idea, first proposed by geologists, that says that we now are officially in a new geological age, which is uh, different from what preceded it, which is the Holocene, which was around the last 10,000 years, which actually worked out super great for humans, right? We saw the rise of agriculture on various different continents, the rise of kind of, you know, like various high civilizations, right, in the Americas, like Asia, Europe, Africa. Um, and one way to think about this as a geological idea is that the idea is that if in 10 million or 100 million years geologists would actually go through the different layers, right, of kind of rock, they would find one layer that would really differ, right, from a previous layer, and that would be the layer that, that we were alive for, right? For example, you would find um, higher levels of radioactivity, you would see indications of a rapid drop in fossils, right, because there's a, a so-called sixth mass extinction, you would find plastic, right, in those layers, right? So this is the idea that humans themselves uh, themselves have become a geological force, right? Um, and incidentally, humans now uh, and their stuff, I think we know way more than all living things on the planet combined, right? So we are actually a noticeable geological force. Um, so that's kind of the idea, and that's, I think, what I earlier referred to as on the material side, right? We were literally just kind of taking up more and more space, right? Um, and, you know, us and also, I think, the animals we raise for food. Um, and just to give you, like, two brief examples, right? One is just kind of light pollution, which um, is a real problem for a lot of animals, and we'll briefly return to that in a moment, right? But this is kind of an image of the, the world at night, right? And you see that there's... There's very few places now, and some of them are actually in Utah, where you can truly see, right, like the stars, like you used to be able to without, um, without artificial light. This is um, from a research institute in Stockholm, which just traces what they call planetary boundary conditions, right? So if it's within green, then what they, they call that, like the safe operating space of Earth. And uh, in the last 20 years, we went from three thresholds that uh, we, you know, overstepped to six, right? And so that's the worry that we're going to keep going on the other ones as well. Um, so very briefly, right? So why are we in this situation? And I mean, this this question is for libraries, right? So I'll just give you kind of a very, very uh, coarse idea of how we could think about this. Um, and I want to distinguish here specifically kind of the more material ca causes and the more maybe cultural ideological causes. So first, the material causes, right? I think we could maybe say one of it is industrialism, right? Just the fact that we have so much more power over the world today, right? So like there are other cultures that maybe were very self-centered in terms of being centered on humans, but they didn't have the power, right, to literally, like, reshape the face of the earth. Um, the other is what we could call political economy, right? I think we just live in an economic system that heavily incentivizes, right, extraction of resources, in, like, you know, to put, like, I don't know, pink flamingos in our gardens, which arguably we don't really need, not just not to survive, but also not 
not even to flourish or to have a good life, but we have them, right? And that's, so I think that's what I mean by the political uh, economy of it. So that's, I think, what marks the Anthropocene as a material constellation, right? This is kind of the objective world, right? The, the world of, of stuff. Um, I think what we need to see paired with that is the world of culture and worldviews, right? And this, I think, sometimes in uh, environmental thinking is called anthropocentrism, right? Again, you have the word anthropos, human, and it's just a self-centeredness of the human species, right? We, that we just kind of see the world um, in terms of what matters for us, right? And this is kind of the, the realm of ideas um, and attention. And I think it's important that those two actually interact, right? And a simple way to think about this is the more we remove our lives from non-humans, the less we think about them, right? Like if our water comes from the tap, we might not think about the fact that actually there needs to be clean water maintained somewhere for us to be able to drink it. Or if our food comes from the grocery store, we don't think about, right, like the, the soil or the sun or for that matter, the farmers, right, who need to kind of raise all of that. Um, so, um, so that's kind of the material influencing the, the kind of idea side, but it's also vice versa, right? If, if we actually, from the beginning, think that non-humans don't matter, we tend to build these worlds that increasingly crowd out uh, non-humans, right? And so, in a nutshell, what I want to focus on with the question of art is right, how this bottom part, anthropocentrism, uh, actually can influence this more material part, right? Um, and I want to actually give you a few examples of what I mean here, right? So the idea is that we actually see the world in a way where we are already predisposed to not even see humans, even if they're right in front of us, right? And I think this is important because it means it's not enough to just drop people somewhere in nature, right? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you all have this friend, right? Like some of you might be that friend who, you know, you try to convince that hiking is cool and nice, and they're like, no, I really don't want to go out there, and I just don't like it, and it's dirty, and they're insects, and it's, I just don't want to go there, right? And so um, it's not just enough, I guess, to kind of push people into nature, right? I think there needs to be a certain mindset, a certain attitude you have to actually see what is actually there, right? Um, and just to give you a few examples, right, this is from Jenny O'Dell's uh, How to Do Nothing, and she's also an artist and draws on art a lot in that book. But she, for example, says it's weird that we think about going into nature as going into solitude, right? She says that when she goes into nature, she thinks about it as actually going to be with non-humans, right? To be with the water, to be with the rocks, to be with the lizards, right? Um, right, and then, like, other examples, right? we often ignore our continuity with non-human history, right? When people, and I've, I've done this when I was younger, right? You wonder, well, who first figured out which food is poisonous and which isn't? Or how did, did alcohol first get discovered? And we always imagine some human being, right? Like kind of walking around, trying things. But obviously, right, a lot of our an relatives in the animal kingdom have been doing all of that, right? Like monkeys get drunk, like elephants get drunk, right? Various animals know what's poisonous, what's not. So there is a continuity here that some of the things we consider genuinely cultural, we already get those from non-humans, but we kind of don't, don't think about that. Um, especially compared to indigenous creation stories, right, where like muskrat or spider have very important roles, right, in bringing fire or in even creating the world. Um, in the kind of Abrahamic creation stories that are dominant, I think, um, currently, right, in the Americas, they just, non-humans don't play a big role, right? They're just kind of not there. And I think this is linked to how non-human contributions are often ignored, right? I'm thinking here about um, John Locke when he talks about property, he says, right, like, well, like humans are the ones who actually make a field worth something because they put in all that work. And if it wasn't for the human contribution, there wouldn't be any wheat or there wouldn't be, right, any grain. But of course, there also wouldn't be any grain without the soil and you know the wind and the earth, etc. Um, so maybe not going to go all of these uh, over these. Maybe let me just uh, mention two more. Uh, maybe these uh, last two: sensory pollution and ignoring the destruction of construction. Right? Sensory pollution. I mean, if you if you're interested in that kind of stuff, Ed Young has written a really really great book about animal perception. And it's, for the most part, not a bummer, but in the last part, he talks a little bit about how we are actually really making life very difficult, right, for a lot of animals. Um, and how we, like, for example, we could ensure the survival of so many more insects and therefore of so many more birds and therefore on so many more species who depend on birds if we just switched all our streetlight to red light, which doesn't make a huge difference for us, 
but it makes a giant difference for insects, right? Because they don't respond to red light, but they die in the millions and billions, right? Because we have this white light everywhere, which we don't, again, don't super, you know, really need. And then finally, Jenny O'Dell talks about how when you construct something like a building, we don't think about the destruction that needs to happen beforehand. And she doesn't say that means we should never destroy anything, right? She doesn't mean that we should completely leave everything um, as it is. She just says, but we're not even aware of it, right? We're not even aware of that when we, like, you know, I think in my hometown in Germany, they just want to build a McDonald's on this meadow, and my sister is very upset because she's, you know, she doesn't like the meadow to go, right? Because there's a lot of stuff there, but it's not, not usually something we think about, right? What, what we lose. Um, so um, I guess going towards the, um, the end of the, the presentation here, right? So, um, so we have this view of the world that really kind of, makes it hard for us to even see non-humans, even if they're right there in front of us. I have this kind of hypothesis that maybe one of the reasons for that is that seeing the world that way is in line with some of the requirements of industrialism and the Enlightenment, right? A world without non-humans is less complicated. It's easier to know. It's, it's in a sense, more lucid, right? Because it's kind of really... It gets really difficult once we bring in non-humans. And it's also, I think, in terms of ethics, it's more complicated, right, once we bring in non-humans. Um, and because, I think, Enlightenment and industrialism value kind of control and clear knowledge above all, they kind of push back against that. And I think um, a good example or a good, um, I think, depiction of that is actually this very famous painting, right, by John Gast, um, which... Um, again, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I think what is important here, right, is that you have kind of the light side that has also kind of all the signs of industry and kind of European civilization on the right, right? You have Colombia, the representation of the United States in the middle. Then the left, it kind of gets dark, and it's the place both of indigenous people who are precisely partly seen as dark because they have a different relationship to the non-human world. Um, and you have these, you know, buffalo fleeing, right, as well. Um, but of course, at the time, this was seen as a great thing, right? That you kind of bring light into the world and you make the world inhabitable for quote-unquote civilized humans, right? And that means two things. You kind of destroy a lot of nature and you destroy civilizations that are not in agreement with that way of relating to nature, uh, which of course continues to this day, right? Like the resistance of both, you know, I think, nature but also indigenous people against this, this approach. Um, let me just kind of skip this and end with kind of two quotes by Joe Harjo, um, so, again, the basic idea, of if, if you take nothing else away, I think is that art is very, very powerful in kind of rewiring the way we actually experience the world, right? I mean, even actually some of the artworks, right? I think like Brittany or artwork about comparing the color schemes, right? How they change. I think to me, that's a really good example of that. So I think also Maddie's, um, like, uh, paintings there, right? Like Turned, I think does a really good job showing what, how water actually literally gets chopped up when you have a propeller in there, and I think that's more like what it looks like from a perspective of sea-dwelling creatures, right? If you're above this, the water, it looks fine, but if you're below it, it's very chaotic and, and dangerous. So Joe Harjo basically just says, some humans say trees are not sentient beings, um, but they do not understand poetry, right? And so I think one way to read this is that she's kind of saying something in line with what I'm suggesting here, right, that if you actually have the right kind of artistic engagements, um, then you actually see the world differently. And let me close with this, because I think it's a really nice way to decenter humans and to kind of go back in, in kind of evolutionary or geological history. And this is based on the idea that a lot of land places that we walk on right now once were under the sea, right? Like Q, Ariel, the mermaid, like song here. Um, but I'm just going to read it and just you know, leave it at that, right? It's, it says, Invisible fish swim this ghost ocean now described by waves of sand, by water-worn rock. Soon the fish will learn to walk. Then humans will come ashore and paint dreams on the dying stone. Then later, much later, the ocean floor will be punctuated by shabby trucks carrying the dreamers' descendants who are going to the store. And I think in the end, what this shows is really that it is their world, non-human worlds, and we just live in it. Thank you. All right, so we need to connect both of these, right?
Oh, you have it on here. Oh, awesome. Perfect. Perfect. All right, let's hope that it's... Thank you for your patience. But I'm not even a doctor. Uh -huh. uh. <laughs> you know, I need to wait a minute again. Is it on? Yeah, I think you need to okay. log in. Do they have the volume button again here? No, oh, it should be right there. That's the first track. Let's see. Uh, okay, let's see. Did you hear oh. play? <laughs> yeah, that's playing. Okay, I think we might just have to turn up the volume, but again, I'm not a Mac person. The, the volume? There's a volume. Maybe. I'm going to need the value. I'm going to be optimistic. I want to choose to be optimistic about this. This The volume's up, but it's not playing. <laughs> Is it not playing? <laughs> You're all heroes for being here, and you can go home to this. <laughs> Understand. It's a very heroic thing today. Yeah, this doesn't play, I don't know what I don't understand why it's not playing. Anybody. Statistically, <laughs> there must be some, like someone here who's a hacker or something. Well, I am not. Okay. <laughs> I'm clicking on the sound settings. No, it's not, it's not, it's not, the file's not playing. Oh, like even on here? Mm -hmm. It is playing. It is playing. Is it? The volume. Oh, then, then, oh, then it's just an output thing, then we go to, then we go to settings. Yeah. There's the volume on here. Oh, hold on. It doesn't seem to be anything else. Yeah. 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 This is a silent piece. 
it's a very conceptual um, it is playing but why is the sound off it is playing That's number, that's another one. That's a different track. That's three. That's play one. Okay, it's playing. Now we have to make it play through this. That's a piece from Puddle Valley, by the way. Now why is it not playing through this? There it is. In between the trees. Yeah, it there takes it a while. Leave it, leave it, leave it. There it is. Why is it not playing through this? That's it. What happened? I only played through this, and it's not playing through this. It just started. Your eyes are alone, talking to each other, taking to each other burdens of light. Light getting lighter lit, getting lighter lit before the brain. No use talking to it, no use taking to it, no use at all. There it is, there it lives, there it talks, there it is, there it stays, there it lives, there it is, there, there, here, here, her. There, there, the, there it is, endless head. How and where, when and why, what and who, me or you, me, my, me, my, me, my, me, mine, do you, do you, me, my, me, my, me, my, me, my, me, my, me, my, me, mine, do you, do you, do you, A, B, C, D, F, G, G, K, M, N, O, P, G, S, Y, Z, do you, do you, do you, me, mine, 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 do you, do mine, not so, when kind, B, one, B, one, 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 B, one, A, B, C, D, F, G, K, M, N, O, P, G, S, Y, Z, B, one, one, B, one, one, B, one, one, B, one, one, one. Then there is the bird, then there is a bird of flies, just for your eyes, it flies, just for your eyes. Then there is the bird of flies, just for your eyes. And then, 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 and then. Your eyes are alone, your eyes are alone. There it is, there it lives, there it stands, there it talks, there it is, there it stays, there it is. There, there, night. There, 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 night. There, there. There is no one on the sand, and the sand is getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And by the time anyone comes, the sand will be unbearably hot, and they'll have to wear shoes or run fast into the water. And someone is sure to forget to take his glasses off and have to swim with them on. And the water won't be the same somehow. It'll be wetter than usual and uncomfortable to be in. Don't worry about the sun. It won't happen in your lifetime. No use talking about it. It won't happen in your lifetime. Don't walk that way. It won't happen in your lifetime. No way you can know. It won't happen in your lifetime. There are none left, and it happened in your lifetime. Be mine, be mine, be mine, and let the rest rest. Be mine, be mine, be mine, and let the rest rest. Be mine, be mine, be mine, and let the rest rest. And let the rest rest. And let the rest rest. Be mine, be mine, be mine, be mine, be mine, be mine. And let the rest rest. Be mine, be mine, be mine, be mine, be mine, be mine. Say on, say on, say on, and let the rest rest. Say on, 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 say on. La segreta, la segreta, la segreta, la segreta, la segreta, non c'è, non c'è. La segreta, la segreta, la segreta, la segreta, la segreta, non c'è, non c'è. Pa, 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 pa. La segreta, la segreta, la segreta, la segreta, non c'è. Non c'è, oh, 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 la segreta non c'è, la segreta non c'è, la segreta, la segreta, la segreta, non c'è, non c'è, missi, 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 oh, 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 qua vicino, qua vicino, qua vicino, qua vicino, qua vicino, su mio qua vicino, qua vicino, qua vicino, qua vicino, su mio qua vicino, qua vicino, qua vicino, qua vicino, qua vicino, su mio qua vicino, qua vicino, qua vicino, qua vicino, qua vicino, su mio qua vicino, qua vicino, qua vicino, qua vicino, qua vicino, su mio qua vicino, 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 qua vicino,
Since it was obvious to him that I had arms and legs and a will. <laughs>
before you sacrifice Mona's. That's another piece. Oh. A bit is no, a bit. No, it won't shut up. A bit is a reminder. Thank you for your patience. Of that sleep which is yet to come. A bed is humility. Bearing its burden in silence. Do you still have some time for questions? I think we're way over time. Let's, uh, let's uh, thank them very much. And